us in worship. God, we ask that you do take whatever those things are that are binding us this morning, God, that you throw them off, God. And that may that song of praise rise up within us no matter where we are in our walk this morning, God, so that we praise you, God. May we join into the song that is going on in heaven right now. May we join into the song of praise all around the world. May we join into the song so that the rocks don't have to cry out, God. And lift up a song, but more importantly, a heart of praise this morning through these songs, Lord. Because every bit is for you and for your glory, God. In your name, amen. Amen. All creatures. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice to Him and sing. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Worship Him in humbleness. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. Alleluia. All glory to our God and King. Every crown thrown down in offering. Every knee shall bow. And 
I've been asked to give my testimony. Um, last Friday, actually July 12th, there was a youth event, youth camp day is what we called it, youth worship day, camp, jubilee, something, all in one day. And before we had the worship service at night, we had some games outside, and my father said no one to stop. But I think as long as I have a heart and I'm breathing, I probably won't. So I didn't. Uh, we have one game is kickball, water ball, where the first base is a baby pool, second base is a family pool, third base is a giant you have to dive into the pool in order to be safe. Home base is a water slide, just so you can kind of get an idea of what the games are like. I was in charge of setting that game up. Then we also had some uh, large blow-up games, the kind that you see at fairs and that sort of thing, only this was a 27-foot high water slide. And the water slide was about 50 feet long, went into a pool. Very important information. So my son and I, since uh, no one was there, just the people setting up, there was about six of us, and we thought we'd, you know, try it out. So we go down this water slide, we've been on it many times, we figured out that if you cross your arms, keep your body straight, you can go a lot faster. So of course we did. And it went down that quite a few times. Uh, the last time, always the last time, uh, we decided to switch sides. I don't know why, we just did. Uh, not that that matters, but evidently it did. So what happens at the bottom of this pool, uh, the slide sort of throws you into each other. You can't see where you're going. You're just like out of control. And we knew that. This time, I went down just a hair before him he came down. It's not his fault at all. Don't blame him. But he's got, if you know Daniel Palma, he's got the Palma build. It's just solid rock. You know, he's all muscle, and that's what my son has inherited, which is good for him. He came down right after me and just slammed into my foot. And immediately, you know, I was underwater. I just felt pain, and my foot was sort of going this way. Luckily, a friend of mine who is also a nurse, has been at camp all these years, wasn't there as the nurse, but you know, just a friend helping me set up, but luckily, you know, thank God she's a nurse. Uh, I was in the pool and I'm like, oh, there's lots of pain, I need something to squeeze, anything, give me a stick, anything, because you know, I'm a guy and I said this, I'm a guy, I don't deal with pain, give me something. <laughs> so she just stuck her arm down there and I squoze her arm, squeezed her arm. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> okay, I'll squoze her arm. Which, you know, there was just so much pain. And I said, is it looking at me? And she just, you know, well-trained nurse. Well? <laughs> well? <laughs> Didn't say that it wasn't. You know, lots of pain. And I heard somebody say, call his mom. And I said, how about my wife? Call my wife. <laughs> I don't know if they said that, but it sounded like it. I was at youth camp. It's what you, it's what you shout, call his mom. So there was lots of pandemonium. Someone was looking for ice. You know, I was in the water. I was freezing. I'm like, you know, never over 140 pounds. I was in this water. I'm just like, <laughs> my lips turned blue in a minute. And I just said, I got to get out of this water. And at that time, I felt Aaron come over. I actually saw him. And he put his hands on my leg. And I think I said something like, don't touch me. And he just prayed something. I really don't know what he said. But immediately, the pain stopped. What I understand is there were bones sticking, like my foot was really facing me. There were bones on this side sticking out. It had swollen to three times its size. Immediately the pain went away. I said I was freezing. I got to stand up. I stood up. My foot went straight. The swelling, it was like someone had taken a pin in a balloon. And we just watched it just go down. And we're like, it's a miracle. It's a youth miracle. And it really was. It was a miracle. And I think, well, I know, there's still some discomfort. And I think who I am, God has said, you know, I'm going to give you not some pain in your hip, but I'm going to let you experience this pain and this discomfort for a little while, just so you know that I am God. The cane, you know, it's just to keep me from falling over. Plus, I always said when I get to a certain age, I'm going to use a cane. It's just cool. <laughs> So I did, you know, it's got a sword in it, don't tell anyone, but you know, it's just, I just told the world, so you know. But God always has a plan. You know, we never know what that is, never. And if it was to speak to the people in the hospital, you know, I told the doctor that was waiting on me, I told her this story and she's like, I think I would go with that. No, really, I would go with that. Every person we've told, of course they are hysterical because we go to the hospital, I check in with a broken foot, 
my son that night was on a trampoline and twisted his foot. So there, he was behind me checking into the hospital. Absolutely hysterical. But all that is for a reason, and we might not know what that is yet, but I know God has a plan. And if it was for those kids to see and to hear that God is a miracle working God, I don't know why we're so surprised. We read about it in the Bible. We don't know the time that has elapsed between miracle upon miracle that Jesus has done. But he still does miracles today. And even though we were shocked, we believe. So have faith, have trust. Step out on nothing because God has something for you and he can perform a miracle for you. All right, let's stand and sing. Give God the glory. From the highest of heights to the depths of the
I loved what Stephen said. Um, it's like, why, why are we surprised? You know, I think somewhere along the line, uh, along the way, we lose sight of what he has done. The way the, the words in that song that we just sang, and the we lose sight of that. And so sometimes we lose that awe of who God is. And I, I hope that those words resonate within you today. And if you, like, where do I start? How do I get that back? How do I get that awe? How do I get that, that faith and that belief? Start, look around you. Look at what he's created. Recount the good things that he's done in your life. If you start to recount the things that he has done in your life, your faith will build. It will bubble over. And you will believe that he is uncontainable, indescribable. We have a tendency to put him in this box and, and, do, and do the tricks that we want him to do for our lives. And when we do that, we limit and we, we, we limit what he has for us. So I, I pray that this day that you'll start, just if you have to write it down, if you just have to tell your children, if you have to tell your husband, just recount the things that he's done. You start with the breath that you have this morning. You start with the house that you ha that you woke up in this morning. You, this, the sun, the sky, it, it, you just, you'll start and you won't be able to stop and it'll be exciting for you, amen? Amen. Well, you may be seated. Children, you are invited to go to your classes at this time and we, Trust that you are going to have listening ears and eyes to see what God has for you this morning. We're so thankful for all of our volunteer uh, children's workers and the staff that's here and the time that they put into it. And if you see them around the halls this morning, make sure that you tell them thank you for the work that they do. We're going to turn our attentions to the video announcements to see what we've got going on at Christ Church this week. Good morning, my name is Christina, and here are just some of the many great events that you need to know about. Each week we offer many Sunday School classes, which are a wonderful way to grow in community with your church family. Among the great offerings, the Married Life Sunday School class meets at 10 a.m. in the Montel Hardwick Hall. This class helps equip married couples with sound biblical teaching on marriage and relationships, covering topics such as communication, finances, intimacy, expectations, and more. For more information, feel free to stop by the class or contact Sherry Banks at sherry.banks at ccnash.org. Our Elevate youth are invited to the weekly Movies with a Message tonight in the Elevate Worship Center from 6.30 to 9 p.m. Bring your own snack and drink to enjoy while watching this great movie together. And as always, the title of the movie won't be revealed until the movie begins. For more info, contact youth at ccnash.org. And last but not least, thank you for going above and beyond this week with your Martha's Food Pantry donations and helping to restock our shelves. Many families have already been greatly blessed through your generosity. As this is a vital and ongoing ministry, donations are always welcome. You can continue to drop off your non-perishable foods in the wooden collection bins in the foyer any day of the week. For more information or questions, contact Amanda Beam at amanda.beam at ccnash.org. And those are just some of the many great things happening at Christ Church. For more information on these events, check out the online calendar at ccnash.org or pick up a bulletin at any information desk. As Christina mentioned, uh, thank you so much for bringing. Some of you came in, at, right after first service. You went to the grocery store and you came in between services and we had stuff dropped off in that foyer for the food pantry. We had to go this week in the middle of the week and get carts to bring the stuff down to the food pantry. We had to make several trips, so I just thank you so much. And as Christina said, there were families that were uh, blessed by that and benefited from your generosity. So thank you again. We want to welcome our first time guest at this moment. And I know we have a whole row right here. I met them, they're from Iowa. But if you would do us the favor as the ushers come down, if you would just raise your hands, if this is your very first time here at Christ Church, we, we have a card that we'd like to give to you so that we can stay connected with you. And um, you can either drop that off in the offering as it goes by, or you can give it to the ushers as they exit. And, uh, or you can go to our hospitality center, which I highly recommend. There'll be people there that you can get uh, refreshments and they can answer any questions that you have. But we're so glad that you're joining us this morning. And we pray that you will feel welcome in this place and that you'll experience his presence in a very real and powerful way this morning. And we're going to continue worshiping the Lord as we go to him and giving of, of our tithes and our offerings. So if you'd bow your heads with me. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, this brand new day, Lord, a day that none of us has ever lived before, a, a brand new moment with you, Lord, to, to write in the pages of history. And Lord, we come to you right now and we in full expectation that you are going to reveal yourself to us in a personal way. Lord, we pray for this, this offering, these tithes, these offerings that everyone contributes, Lord. We pray that whether they're dropped in the plate today or whether they've been given online earlier in the week. Lord, we pray that you would bless those, Lord. We know that you are our Jehovah Jireh. You are a provider. And Lord, that we can trust you with our, with our finances. We can trust you with our hearts, Lord, with our minds. And Lord, we pray that you would bless these givings, Lord, that they would be used to further your kingdom in this church, in this community, and around the world. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you recognize that, let's sing that together. This is my Father's world. This is my Father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature, all nature sings and round me rings. The music of the spheres. This is, this is my Father's Second verse, this is my father's world. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their maker's praise. This is my This is my father's world. This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget. Oh, let me never forget. Though the wrong, that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler, yeah. This is, this is my This is my father's world. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget. Oh, let me never forget. That though the wrong, that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the This is my father's world. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. The battle is not done. Aren't 
aren't you thankful? Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Amen. That's one of my favorite hymns. I love it. Praise Him in the morning for tall and lofty trees. And praise Him in the evening for children on their knees. Oh, and praise Him in the noonday for gentle birds that sing. Oh, oh, oh praise Him. Praise him for the peaceful porch and rocking chairs that sway. And praise him for the rolling hills where children laugh and play. Oh, and praise him for the wandering soul that never lost their way.
please remain standing. We'll read the word of the Lord together today. Mark 16, verse 9 through 20. After Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them that Jesus was alive and she had seen him, they didn't believe her. Afterward, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. They all rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Still later, he appeared to the 11 disciples as they were eating together. He rebuked them for their stubborn belief, unbelief because they refused to believe those who had seen him after he had been raised from the dead. And then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. When the Lord Jesus had finished talking with them, he was taken up into heaven and sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. And the disciples went everywhere and preached, and the Lord worked through them, confirming what they said by many miraculous signs. This is the word of the Lord. Let me read to you as, as you remain standing just a, 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 just a few verses from Acts chapter 5, verse 12. <clears throat> and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and yet none of the rest dare join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Amen. You may be seated. I have a, just a couple things I want to mention as we get into the message today. First, it's appropriate that uh, Stephen Tedeschi would have given testimony earlier in the service uh, because I, I, want, I just want to say something about him. He served as fine arts director for 18 years, and he has given much of his life to this church, a good portion of his adult life for sure. 18 years he served our congregation um, and uh, as fine arts director. And he's resigning from church staff to follow uh, God's calling for him and Miriam to develop the Arts Place, which is a nonprofit organization for training and mentoring artists. And we began talking about that about three years ago, you recall, there, thereabouts. And, uh, and they've been, they've been uh, uh, getting this ministry up and, and going. And if you'd like to talk to them, about how you can be a part of this. They would be very appreciative and you'll be uh, investing your time, energy, and finances in something very worthwhile, particularly in our city. So, you know, we'll miss Stephen as part of our staff because he's, he's just been a part of this for a long time, but we bless him and support him as he pursues his calling. We'll be able to work with Stephen on a contractual basis through the arts places as needs arrive in the future, and so you'll continue to see him around, and I just ask that you continue to remember him in, in your prayers. And also in, take note of, of, this, uh, of this testimony that he gave you early in the, in the, mess, in the uh, service because it's so important uh, for the message that I want to give you now. I want to talk to you about signs and wonders. A few years ago, there's a woman in our church. Her name is Andrea Hale, and she came to my office and she had been pursuing orders in the Episcopal Church, uh, but for a number of reasons, not the least of which, that she had married a man in our church. Uh, she had decided to become a member of Christ Church. But she wanted to continue her ministerial formation in the Anglican community, and since she knew I was a part of that community, she wanted to know how you continue doing that as being a part of Christ Church. 
But her only problem was, in her words, that she had never had any sort of charismatic experience, like many of you may uh, report today. She wasn't opposed to experiences, uh, charismatic experiences, but she thought that that might be an expectation on our part, and, and she needed to explain that this had not happened in our life, in her life, and so that if we wanted her to be a part here, she just wanted to clear the air on that. So I asked her what she did for a living, and she told me she was a chaplain at a psychiatric uh, facility. So I said, do you minister in any way to the patients? And she said, of course I do. She said, I offer short service. I pray for those who want prayer. And I said, and nothing spiritual or spooky ever occurs to you when you minister to these patients? No, she said, nothing that I can think of, she said, except for this weird thing that sometimes happens with my hands. I said, tell me about that. She said, well, it's kind of silly. It's a little embarrassing, actually, to mention. I said, well, just try me. Just, just go ahead and tell me. She said, well, sometimes when I pray and I place my hands on the patients, my hands get very hot. And I said, and then what happens? I said, she said, well, I'm not sure, but I've noticed there seems to be a correlation when that happens, when my hands get hot and reaction in the patients, and they, they'll, they'll sometimes cry or they feel helped and say, I've helped them, and, but I'm just embarrassed and acknowledging all that. I, I don't even know what all that means. So I said, well, that'll do for a charismatic experience for now. I, I, <laughs> besides that, I said, you need a spiritual covering in your work. And uh, so I urged her to go through ordination as a deacon in our local church as she continued to pre prepare for orders in the broader Christian community. So we ordained uh, uh, Andrea the same night we ordained Colleen Hollis. It was a very sweet and intimate service. And during the uh, ordination service, which if, uh, if there's room for that, I like to do to call people up and say, anybody wants to pray for folks or give them a word that you may feel God has placed on your heart to do so. And the two deacons were kneeling there, and I was in front of them. And so I heard uh, Jackie Stanfield uh, pray for Andrea. And this is kind of what what she said. She said, Lord, she said, I, I don't know this young woman that you've just called into ministry. I don't know what she does, but you will, will you help her to realize that when she places her hands on people, they're no longer her hands and they're your hands. And Lord, I just feel led to pray for her hands for some reason. And she took Andrea's hands in hers and she began to pray. Well, at this point, Andrea's really crying because she knew Jackie didn't know her from Adam and didn't know anything about uh, her story and what she had told me. And I thought that was the perfect story to begin this message on signs and wonders. We've read two passages this morning about the way in which Christian witness is accompanied in the New Testament by unexplainable phenomena that early Christians believed were supernatural in origin. Jesus said these sorts of things would happen, and as we see in nearly every page of the book of Acts, the Lord kept his word. Now, most Christians don't question that. They, most of us believe that supernatural phenomena occurred in the early days of the church, but the question is whether this phenomena still occurs today. And here's why we question that. In the European Enlightenment, which took place from about 1650 to 1800, Western societies underwent a fundamental change in the way that people de defined and experienced reality. And enlightened uh, European people swept away all the ghosts and goblins and miracles to make way for science which is a careful process that leads to experience-based uh, and evidence-based uh, uh, conclusions. The Enlightenment was a huge advance uh, in uh, human life. It helped us learn about germs and molecules and DNA and thousands of other uh, parts of reality that has enormously improved the way that we live our lives. So if our children get sick, we no longer shake the bones of a bat and the hair of a white buffalo over them. We run blood and urine samples and we investigate the cause of their illness and we develop a treatment plan to heal them. That is usually what we do. Charismatic or not or whatever else we are, uh, we, we, uh, we are under medical care because uh, we've, we've come to realize that that, that works. This advance in human life flowed from the work of Christ in the world. It was a result of God's desire to heal people that's expressed in Jesus Christ. And modern medicine emerged 
in Christian cultures. So don't ever feel guilty for seeking the advice of doctors or social workers or psychologists and so forth. It doesn't make you weak or unspiritual to ask for the help of trained people. It helps you heal, and I highly recommend it. Uh, when my wife had a brain aneurysm, I, I, I appreciated all the prayers and all the prayer clause, and I did all of that, and I praised God for it. But uh, none of the charismatic prayer team at my church was getting near my wife's brain. I'm going to tell you that. So I, I applaud all the advances made in human society by the Enlightenment. But the Enlightenment came at a price. It seemed to gradually turn people and societies into machines. And so gradually we've come to think of love as merely sublimated lust. The sacrificial attitudes and behaviors of parents we now see as merely the biological urge to preserve our genes. Family loyalty and things like that we think of as the animal herd instinct, etc. So slowly this attitude has changed the way even Christians in the Western world view their faith. Now there were three major Christian reactions to the Enlightenment, and these persist today. First is simply to view the biblical and historical reports of miracles as the mistaken conclusions of sincere but more primitive people. And so if you have that view, the idea of water into wine and the parting of the Red Sea and things like that were either naturally occurring events that seemed providential and miraculous at the time, or they are simply literary embellishments that illustrate the more important moral uh, lessons of our faith. The second reaction to the Enlightenment was to claim that although miracles did occur, in the early days of the church, these are no longer welcome or needed uh, because the church is now established and the Bible is written. And in this view, modern <clears throat> miracles would undermine the authority of Scripture and the sovereignty of God. The third reaction was to discount science and modern discoveries altogether and to retreat in earlier forms of human thought and culture. In this view, Christians don't wrestle with the implications of things like the theory of relativity or the genome project or so forth, they put their fingers in their ears and cling to their familiar world and they just don't want to hear what's been happening in the last hundred years. Christians who embrace this reaction to the Enlightenment rarely study biology, paleontology, neurology or other forms of knowledge that might threaten to shake their faith. And if they do, they compartmentalize their faith into airtight chambers in which different values govern their lives in church as in society in general. But none of these three approaches work. Because if miracles do not occur today, they probably never did. If miracles never occurred, then our faith is probably not much more than fantasy and comforting myth. And if our faith requires us to ignore the implications of the last hundred years of scientific discovery, which we, we're using the technology from that scientific discovery, the most, the most rabid fundamentalist uses an iPad and then uh, disagrees with this science on which the iPad is based. It's, it's inconsistent, it's unethical, and it, it, it's kind of crazy. And if this is the way that we have to approach the scripture, it's a cruel trap of dysfunction and dishonesty that more mature and intelligent people ought to reject. And so the subject of signs and wonders is a crucial component of our faith that cannot be explained away and it cannot be avoided. Now, Mary Magdalene had seen Jesus alive and so did a group of disciples out taking a walk, but the others didn't believe. What she claimed was too big and too unbelievable. And so Jesus appeared to them and told them in essence that they needed to get used to seeing reality through different eyes. The passage we've read from St. Mark's gospel, by the way, is often disputed now. It's as uh, being inauthentic and not original to the text. And many of our modern translations lead it out, leave it out altogether. And that may have been, uh, as you've read the scripture today, you may have seen that. But I don't think it matters at all whether St. Mark wrote these words, and it doesn't bother me the least if he didn't. The passage is very early, and it's evidence that early Christians believed Jesus said something like this, and we have the book of Acts that claims that believers actually experienced uh, things like Jesus said would occur. Just to tell you what my view of Scripture is, I think the author of the Scripture is the Holy Spirit. 
And human instrumentalities that God used to get us the Holy Spirit, all of the authors and redactors and editors and copiers and church councils and all of that, were part of the providence of God to get his word to us. So when I opened the word, when I opened the Bible, my first question is not who wrote this and why did they write it, what's the original purpose and all of that. Those are important questions. I get around to that. I'm, I'm, I'm not just a Philistine living out in a cave. I do ask those questions. But my first question is, what is God saying to me in this passage? And so I received this passage from St. Mark's Gospel as Scripture and indeed as the Word of Jesus Christ to me today. And that puts me at odds with a lot of contemporary biblical scholarship, but that's okay. I'm of the opinion that my view will outlast all the academic fads of the last few decades because it happens to be correct. And, and, and that, that doesn't mean that, you know, that the biblical scholars are wrong to say that a portion of Scripture was written later than another portion of the same book or whatever. And evident linguistic evidence demonstrates that there's connection to some extra biblical source. I don't mind all of that. I read all of that. I take it seriously. That's all important stuff. But the more important question to me is whether the Holy Spirit gave us this text. And I have concluded that he does and has. And this happens to be the opinion held by God's people in all times and all places. And so it is a view that will ultimately prevail. My opinion is not just a leap into the dark, some belief at the expense of reason. I have rational and reasonable basis for believing what I do about Scripture. But those reasons happen not to be a part of contemporary Western worldview. I believe that Jesus promised that signs and wonders would accompany the preaching and proclamation of the gospel and the ongoing life of the church. St. Luke certainly thought so. In the passage we read today from, uh, from Acts chapter 5, Luke tells us that the people of Jerusalem brought sick people and those tormented by evil spirits and laid them out in the streets so the shadow of Peter might fall on them and heal them. So... We looked at that. We understand poor people get desperate. They do what they have to do to find healing and help. If they go have to shake the bones of a bat or whatever it is they have to do, we understand. That's touching. Desperate people do desperate things. But notice what Luke says. Now, this is either true or it's untrue. But notice what he says. A multitude gathered from the surrounding cities. People brought sick people and those tormented by evil spirits, and they were all healed. Now, I've preached for a couple of weeks here about the moral belief system of our faith, and I'm glad I've done that, and I, I will stand behind it. But if Christianity is nothing more than a moral code, it doesn't offer us much more than sacrifice and pain for what we're not really quite sure what. But that's not what Christianity offers. Christian faith offers healing and redemption, and it offers human transformation, and it offers love, and it offers the presence of God, and it offers us a faith that, in the words of the Scripture, through many infallible proofs, he shows himself to be yet alive. I, I tell you, without such things, Christianity is a moralism that makes people miserable and even cruel. Have you ever met people that are standing firm for the faith that you know they're standing firm on the faith and soon they're going to stand on you? Have you ever known people that are just absolutely God-awful people that claim to be staunch defenders of the faith? What is compelling and what is like Jesus in the life of people like that? That's not what the world needs. They need to hear someone say, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. A few months ago, National Geographic had a photograph, had photographs of uh, great sacred places around the world. And one of those uh, photographs really moved me. It was a veiled middle-aged woman who had walked 120 miles to visit the tomb of Mary Magdalene. She had been converted to Christian faith, and it, as the little caption says, but tears were streaming down her face, and they were visible even under her veil. And the short explanation under the photograph was that she had converted to Christianity because she learned that Christianity was a faith in which a fallen woman might become a saint. And she had made this pilgrimage to thank God for the life of a saint who had become important to her in her journey to God. 
Now, that's a miracle. There's no doubt about that. All Christians will affirm, yes, absolutely, that Jesus changing lives, absolutely. But what I'm asserting this morning is that Jesus is present in a more direct way among his people and that he will show up in observable and supernatural ways to heal, deliver, provide, and direct the lives of those who seek him. And furthermore, I assert that this has occurred in every believer's life and has occurred throughout history. And it's not a Pentecostal thing. It's not a charismatic thing. It's a Jesus thing. I will go further and say that this supernatural grace is at work even in the lives of those Christians who deny the ongoing supernatural work of the Spirit. I was teaching in a church that claims that all miracles ceased after, after the, the Bible was already written and the Holy Spirit got sick and died or went in retirement or something. And I was, I was talking about my, 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 my belief in all this. And so, uh, so the, these folks, I told them, miracles happen here. You just don't uh, acknowledge them. And they said, well, how would we know? For example, someone said, how would we know if somebody prophesied in our church? I said, that's easy. It's the person that stands up and said, I've just got something on my heart I've got to say. And I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrupt. And then they say it and everybody goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. And they feel something in their heart. I said, if he's charismatic, his eyes has to roll back in his head. He has to shake. And he said, yay, yay, yay. But it's the same thing at work throughout God's church. They all laughed. They knew what I was talking about. It's true. Now, uh, uh, what I believe happened to Christians uh, in our post-enlightenment world is this. We have narrowed our focus and eliminated our awareness of the supernatural world. And usually supernatural occurrences appear at the time they occur to be completely normal and not much out of the ordinary. It's only in retrospect that we say, hey, wait a minute, how did that person just happen to be there at that, at that moment? Why did that person who owed me that money for years suddenly decide to pay the very week I needed that specific amount? You know what I'm talking about. John Wimber called this way of experiencing spiritual life living naturally supernatural naturally supernatural. He meant that signs and wonders occur within the framework of nature because nature is something God already created supernaturally. Do you know that God created an elephant in the Andes mountains simply by speaking them into existence? That's fairly spectacular and phenomenal. And it's still there, and it is evidence of the greatness and the grandeur of a God who creates. And since God created nature as he did, we can believe he did it in the way he wanted to do. So he's not likely to create a unicorn in the middle of this room this morning to demonstrate his power and presence. Because unless unicorns just didn't happen to make it on the ark, God never created a unicorn. Human beings created a unicorn. So God's not going to make a unicorn, but he may heal some animal, and he you know, God works within his created order because he did it the way he wanted to do it the first time. When we sensationalize uh, our expectation of miracles, we end up exaggerating or even becoming fraudulent in our claims. That doesn't help the cause of Christ, and it becomes deception and sometimes even demonic. Yes, people are raised from the dead in the Bible, but they raise people from the dead down at Vanderbilt every day by putting electric paddles on dead people's chests. God made us to have life, and so when earthly life ends, sometimes he will give us a reprieve and allow us to live a bit longer. Just think about this. Whether a raising from the dead occurs as an answer to prayer without medical intervention or as the result of people's training in the medical arts that have flourished as a result of Christianity's long search for ways to heal people, some little child will get his mother back and instead of attending a funeral and will give God glory and thanks. Amen. When Jesus healed the leper, he told the man to go to the priest to be examined. Now, did Jesus do that because he doubted the validity of the healing? Of course not. He did it to submit his claims of supernatural grace to natural human evaluation. 
Why did he do that? Because God is in the business of building community. That too is a part of his healing work. God wants us to work as a body and as a family and not to be constantly amazed at some guru. And so God has placed systems in the world and he works through those systems just as he works in, 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 uh, in answer to believing prayer. That's why we don't see it inconsistent when somebody is sick and they go to the doctor and we set up a prayer vigil for them. And we've had many times, especially, I, I, I remember when Katie was sick, her doctor, physician, many times he said he nearly gave up that she could make it through. But he came here and said, but time and again, I watched this community of prayer all over the city in prayer for her, and I saw God pull her through. He gave God the glory, but he's a man of science. He did his work as well. This is the way God has created the world. It's the way he wishes for it. To occur but you know supernatural grace does not overturn nature supernatural life brings out the potential of nature and it perfects nature and it cooperates with nature and the reason this is true is simple nature is God's work and the supernatural world is merely a part of the creation we don't ordinarily see but sometimes in moments of grace we do but we can learn to see it and we can learn to expect it the early Christians prayed for signs and wonders, and so should we. But early Christians left it up to God to decide what signs and wonders he would perform, and so should we. In the book of Acts, sometimes those signs and wonders came in the forms of dreams and strange coincidences. They didn't automatically receive those dreams as being from God because they knew, just like us, that every human being dreams. But they believed God might speak through this naturally occurring thing that happens to us each night that God may speak and so early Christians had prophetic impulses intuitions and so should we Paul told us not to despise these impulses but to discern with others whether these impulses were consistent with God's Word and whether they contained anything spiritually meaningful and we should do that too I wish I had the time today to bring up and, and, and I really uh, don't, but uh, I think uh, often there, there's a man right at the back of the congregation today, uh, Pavel Chernish. He was in prison uh, for his faith in Russia and, uh, and suffered, and he and his family suffered unbelievable things. And, uh, and so the believers had to trust God in the way that I'm talking about. And Pavel was in prison, and he needed, he needed to get back to his family and to his church. And so he began to seek God in prison and, uh, and, and one night, the Lord met him in a dream, and he heard a voice. He saw a man with a parchment uh, in a robe, and, and he heard the voice of God speaking to the man, write this decree down. Pavel Chernish is to be released tomorrow from prison and sent back home for the work that I've asked him to do. And he said when he saw it wrote down and he woke up the next morning, he said, well, I'm going home today. Well, the, 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 you know, the warden came around, sent him out to work, and he... And, uh, and at 10 o'clock, they came to get him then. Usually that's an ominous sign in those days. They came to get him. The authorities were going to talk to him like, ooh, he wasn't afraid. He was rejoicing. I'm going home. They told him some unexplained thing has come down. We've got this decree from way up uh, that uh, you're going to be released today. And he was released. And, and he tells the story, but he got, he, he got to the train station. He got to the train station and, and, and there was an officer of the Soviet army that met him and said, you're going with me and said, I'm going in the other direction. No, you're going with me. Well, there was nothing to argue with. But what happened, this man got him safely home. He was under the care of some unknown officer in the Soviet army which disappeared in a crowd suddenly when he went to thank him. Now, 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 listen, through many infallible proofs, he showed himself to be yet alive. You understand what I'm saying? I'm saying to you that we've had two wrong kind of approaches here. One is to deny that these things exist, and another to get us all, all worked up in, in some kind of place where we really don't believe it either, but we're working ourselves up to. When God's people are aligned with God and just trust the Lord and walk through with him, he will speak in a way that we need him to speak. He will act in a way we need him to act. Through many infallible proofs, he will show himself to be yet alive. We get all worked up, whether it's a doctrine, whether it's a separate work of grace, whether it's this, whether it's that. Leave all that be. You say, I'm not charismatic. I don't care. I don't care 
care I don't care. I'm not Pentecostal. I don't care I don't care. This is to all flesh. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's what the Lord says. And the Lord will visit and is visiting and has visited every part of his church that will just open up even a little door and say, come Holy Spirit, do your work among us as you wish to do it. We get all tied up in some sectarian thing and we empower that and, and, and then we fight. And, and, we, and the Holy Spirit flees even if you're, if you're defending him. See, if we believe that a real miracle will overwhelm us so much that there's no question about whether it was supernatural, we're not likely to notice God is speaking or healing or working on our behalf in the day to day. I mean, what if Pavel got up the next morning and said, well, you know, it was a dream. I, it must have been something in the food that night. Or, and what if, you know, he said, I'm not going with an army officer, you know, but there was a trust that, oh, this is another part of life. This is, not, this is not just the kind of rational, linear kind of way we're used to thinking, but sometimes the Spirit is leading in ways we've got to learn how to, uh, to, to follow Him. Amen. Think about this for a moment. When you cook, do you notice that people just love to congregate around your food and talk about it? Now, that may be because you're just a good cook, but it may also be because God's given you the gift of hospitality and the food may be a divine prop for healing relationships and calming troubled hearts. We dismiss too quickly the things that God has placed in our lives as natural gifts. And it's not one thing or the other. Our natural gifts are given to us by the Lord. And sometimes they're graced with supernatural ways that's, that's kind of spooky and weird, but usually not. But one thing for sure, if we don't pray for the sick, we can't complain that there's no healings. Discounting the supernatural becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's unlikely that any church that doesn't pray for the sick will see very many supernatural healings. And if they occur, we will likely explain them away. So we have to act in expectation of, of signs following. But the signs will be of God's choosing and may or may not be terribly overwhelming. But they will occur if we expect them and if we're prepared to recognize them. Let me tell you something about the supernatural world. When you die, some part of you will immediately be conscious and aware of another world. You'll probably see loved ones who have died. You'll sense the presence of God in an extraordinary way, and you will enter into eternal peace and joy. Now, I believe that like I believe the sun's going to rise in the morning. I've been with too many people dying not to believe it. But an awareness of the supernatural is simply, uh, uh, is simply the habit of looking at that, things, uh, the, that way now. You don't have to wait till you die to have this experience. Though on this earth we see spiritual life, as Paul said, through a glass darkly. And I'm going to just tell you a, a story to conclude this day that's a powerful story that happened in my life. A few years ago uh, in Phoenix, a 40-year-old woman named uh, Denise Bennett came to our church in Phoenix. And uh, she was a race car driver. And she was tiny, a race car driver. She's a lady. But she was strong in, a, in, a, in that kind of way that didn't make her one, one less inch a lady. She was just a dear person. And she was gloriously and joyfully uh, converted. Six months later, she was diagnosed with lung cancer. And uh, true to the beliefs of many of our more radical charismatics in our church, uh, Denise claimed healing went on her joyful way said, you know, I'm healed, I don't care what the doctors say, and that kind of thing. She remained symptom-free for two years, to the amazement of her doctors. And she would tell me about arguing with the doctors who showed her blood work and x-rays, but she laughed, and she grew in God, and she was a delight and a joy. And one day, um, she began coughing violently and had to be rushed to the hospital. And she was terrified and bewildered, and her faith was shaken. And she cried and kept asking me why, and I was just there just shaking my head and praying with her, and I, I, I didn't know what to tell her, and other Christians around were saying, uh, you know, she just had to be strong in faith and not give in to these lying symptoms and so forth. And so she didn't die, at least for several more months. And then one morning at 5 o'clock, I was called to the hospital, and uh, I... Uh, they, the boys said, Denise is dying, you need to come quickly, and I, I drove to the hospital, and I was weeping and praying, and, and, I, and I was, when I have a, a part of my ministry, um, 
when people's lives are in danger, I, 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 there's, uh, I like walking with people in that time. Like is the wrong word, but I feel called to do it. And, and I, I do intercede for them. And I was interceding for her. And I said, Lord, don't do this. She's new to the faith. She's not ready. And I'm not ready. The church isn't ready. Uh, for the health of her and her family and uh, church and everything, I ask you not to do this. And I was just crying and pl praying bitterly. But when I got to the hospital, she was sitting up in the bed. And I remember that scene well. I'll never forget it because I hugged her from the relief of seeing her alive. But when my hands touched her back, I realized she had on a hospital gown and she was nearly naked. So I pulled back from her like I'd been shot, you know. And I said, oh, Denise, I'm sorry. I didn't think about your uh, hospital gown. And uh, she looked at her family and friends were there, and she said in a disgusted voice, you know, men are such pigs. <laughs> she said, my preacher comes to pray for me for this dying woman, and this is what he notices. She said, that, that's, that's, that's how much uh, sanctity there is there. And they all laughed at my expense, and she laughed, and she said, I got to tell you something. I said, what's happened? She said, I just saw Jesus. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, when they brought me in, I couldn't get my breath, and I was so afraid. And then a door appeared in that wall right there, and there was no door there, but she said, there it was. And she said, Jesus was standing in the door, and he told me he's going to be coming for me soon, and there was nothing to be afraid of. And, and she said, you tell people that when that time comes, and I'm going to walk through the door, and I'm going to be okay. And she laughed. I saw Jesus too that day. And her face, a terrified woman fighting death, had seen the glory of God and was ready to face life's most feared event. This is that which overcomes the world, even our faith. Signs and wonders remain a part of the work we do and the life we live. And when we forget that, we turn our faith into a system, a club, a formula, some kind of moral or legal uh, code of some sort and it ceases to bring life into a broken and a dark world it's supernatural grace that makes bad people good that gives frightened people courage that gives hateful people love sometimes this supernatural grace manifests as an unusual phenomena and provokes a lot of wonder and awe but more commonly it just strengthens and directs and provides and comforts us as we quite not naturally go about unassuming on our way in following Christ into eternity. Because God created the natural world, it's the natural world that is the conduit for the supernatural by God's design. And that's why we anoint cloths and sent them out to be on sick people. That shadow of Peter, you know, it, it didn't have any more power in it than any other, other people's shadow, I suppose, but people were expecting. That's why we lay our hands on those who are present. We share our dreams. We read the scripture. We're always groping around to discover what things mean and what we are to make of them. And as we do these things in humility, God does not fail to appear. And because he does, the hungry are fed, the sick are healed, sinners are converted, songs are written, children are loved, and God is made known through us. Signs and wonders. It's not the work of miracle healers and specially anointed superstars. Signs and wonders are the result of the work of God through ordinary people, even sinner people like Mary Magdalene, whom the Lord chose to be his first witness of the resurrection. And praise be to God, Jesus works through ordinary and flawed people like you and me. Amen. I would like our deacons to quickly come and prayer counselors. Would you just come stand here very quickly? And if you have a need in your life right now, I want you to quickly make your way forward so they can lay hands on you. I don't know if we have prayer claws today, but if there are people not, not present, we're always, uh, we're always delighted to send them a cloth that we can pray for. I want you to quickly come now. I've preached the sermon. It's the Lord's duty and responsibility to fulfill the promise that he's made. These signs will follow them that believe. Will you come? Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. 
Fill us with your power. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Live inside of me. Let's sing that again. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. We believe it. We are in your presence. Lord, fill us with your power. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. You're the living water. You're the living water. Never drying fountain. Never drying fountain. Comforter and counselor. Comforter and counselor. Take complete control. Take complete control. Comforter, counselor, take complete control. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We are in your presence. Fill us with your power. here that has a personal or business uh, issue uh, where you need God to give you wisdom or provision of some sort financially, I wonder if you would make your way here to the front right now. And I'd like to hear back this week as God works in your life to meet these needs. Would you just do that? Thank you, Lord. Welcome, Holy Spirit. We believe this. We are in your presence. And we ask this. Fill us with your power. Live inside of me. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want. my cup fill it up and make me whole fill my cup Lord fill my cup Lord I lift it up Lord I lift it up Lord come and quench this thirsting come and quench this thirsting of my soul Bread of heaven, feed me. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Here's my cup, fill it up and make me
more than ever, more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you more. Would you please stand? Everybody, certainly including me, go through periods of life where it feels like you're not hearing much from God and you believe you've done your best and you've tried to do your best and you, you just get confused. That's the human experience. Some of us are raised to think that somehow we're away from God or that we're cold in God. and. Uh, we get discouraged because we're human beings. And the people of God got discouraged uh, as we read about even in these disciples. They could hardly bring themselves to believe. But as we read in this passage from Mark, many times God is with us and speaking to us and even providing for us, and we simply are in a funk and we can't see his hand. So what I prayed in these final moments today is the Lord would reveal where he's at right now in your life what he's doing presently and how he's working right now. Amen. If you think about it, maybe you had a dream last night where the Lord gave you some instruction. Maybe a word in your scripture reading leapt out and just burned, but then you kind of forgot about it. Maybe someone said something to you, or, but you've kind of forgot it. And the Lord said that, you know, when the word is given forth that the birds, the fowl, the air come and take the seed out of the ground. That happens to us all the time. Jesus said it would. But right now in these final moments, as Christopher leads us in the chorus, I want you just to kind of bask in the presence of God. And I'm asking God to reveal to each of us how he may be working presently in our lives and to see his hand. Amen. Sing, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, pure and holy, tried and true, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. Find us faithful, Lord. Find us faithful. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving. We thank you for the many ways, big and small, that you show up in our life. We pray that you will give us eyes to see you. The society we're living in, Lord, many times almost blinds us to the work of God in our lives. And we get discouraged. But like Christy and the choir was singing today, we thank you for those small things. Those small things. And sometimes those small things, when we acknowledge them and we follow them, they turn into great things indeed. I pray throughout this week you would make us aware, super aware of that other world in which you are moving through into this world to transform and grace and provide and direct in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.